Whoa. We <laughs> are live. What's up, Rishi? How's it going, Ryan O'Hara? I don't know. We're going to let these attendees pour in. Look at this. They're, you guys, come on. Stay civil. I see you all joining the Zoom. It looks like it looks like people are fighting. There's a line out the door. This is insane. It's actually um, down the block. It's down Some the block? People- yeah, they're selling hot dogs. It's a, it's a thing. It's actually, it, has nothing, it has nothing to do with this. It's <laughs> Shake Shack. <laughs> um, so, Rishi, people are probably noticing you're in a different location this week. I, I am. What's I going am. on? So you left your parents' house? I'm done. Done for good until next week. But I am in a new place called my girlfriend's apartment. And Whoa. it's fascinating. <laughs> Whoa, that's exciting. Um, we're going to tell a little storyline while people join. Last night at around 11.30 p.m., I'm in bed. I've got my onesie on, ready to go get some sleep. And I get a little text from Rishi. I'm going to read the text to you. It says, can you please send me a video of how to tie a tie? <laughs> What's up with that, Rishi? I don't, all right, so I haven't tied a tie in a long time. Now, a lot of people are wondering, what about the other B2B tonight? I have a dad, and he tied all my ties. <laughs> so I was confused, and I asked my dad. He couldn't explain it to me. My brother doesn't know how to do it, so I texted you. You're the only other person I know that ties ties. So does that mean that you see me as a father figure? <laughs> mother, father, whichever one you like to look. I like the mother more than I, anything else. I, listen, if you want to, after this episode, why don't we hop on a Zoom and we can listen to some Cat Stevens together? <laughs> that sound good? <laughs> it sounds great. All right. So people have joined. Uh, we're getting people coming in right now. Uh, well, we're going to kind of get started. A couple questions and house cleaning items for people as you join. Yes, this thing will be recorded. Yes, welcome people that came from PFL and Demand Base. Great companies, great products, great people. Um, some of my favorite people out there in the universe. Uh, some other things that we're going to do. Rishi, you want to talk about asking questions and stuff? Yeah, I would love to. If you have any questions or concerns about Ryan's hair and tie, um, you could put that in the chat box. And if you have any questions, put in the Q&A section. I'll be just, monitoring it. Just so just so people know too, and we'll, we'll probably interrupt a couple of times. Usually when we do P2B tonight, the whole purpose of this is we think webinars are typically, they get kind of boring a little bit. So we try and do things a little differently here. This whole episode is themed around sales and marketing alignment. And what we wanted to do this week to kind of get people ready is show you some cool things you can do when you it's, it's not just a nice thing to say in a buzzword for a meeting. It can actually be something that your team does together for collaborating, coming up with creative ideas together, uh, all that stuff. And we're going to kind of do a little bit of a backstory. So uh, last year, Rishi, I assume you know to queue up everything right now, but uh, last year, R- Rishi and I were trying to think of something cool that we could do that would be an experiment for prospecting. So we came up with this idea. What if we went out on the internet and we made... Uh, ad, but we made it just for one prospect. And we made it about the prospect instead of making it about lead IQ. Naturally, we were like, oh, I know something we could do here. Why don't we get Jeremy Levier on our team to give us a target account that he wants to break into to make the video for? Uh, What ended up happening was we made this and the target account we did for this was Drift. The following is an informational made by the team at Lead IQ and the sad attempt to prospect Drift sales team. The branding, pitch, and video were strictly made without Drift's notice, consent, or awareness. Lead IQ apologizes in advance for what you're about to see. Drift did not ask us to make this. We don't blame them. Hi, my name is Rishi Mathur, and boy, do I have an opportunity that will open doors for you. Do you have prospective buyers that are coming to your website that aren't converting? Are you tired of prospective buyers filling out lead forms? Do I have a solution for you? Start conversation marketing. With Drift! Before we got Drift, we had trouble getting website visitors to convert. But afterwards, we grew. As a VP of marketing, I'm constantly filling out lead forms. And it makes my hands super sore. Whenever I go to a company website and I see a little Drift message, my heart skips with joy. That's right, Ryan! This is your customer's life when you don't use Drift. Mmm, so difficult. This is your customer's life with Drift. Ah, so easy. Are your customers feeling lonely? Use Drift to help combat loneliness with great conversation. Whoa, what's this? Meet Driftbot, Drift's chatbot from the future. What's up, Driftbot? Driftbot. Using the Drift lead bot, we increased our conversions by over 5 million percent. And now I get to keep my job. Thanks, Drift. 
no more ignored website visitors, no more sketchy leads, and most of all, no more lead forms. With Drift, it's real conversations with real people. Grow your company with Drift today. Drift starts as low as $499.99 a month with 12 easy payments. To talk with a conversation specialist, visit us on the World Wide Web, www.drift.com, or get started with a free trial. That's www.drift.com, D-R-I-F-T dot com. Order now! So what we did is we took that video and we posted on LinkedIn and tagged Drift on it. And uh, it started with Jeremy because Jeremy was the rep that was working on the account. As, as we did this, uh, we posted it online. We tagged Drift. Instantly, just people flooded from the Drift team commenting and engaging on the post. I think it ended up getting well over 60,000 views. And tons of Drift people were sharing it. But the, gr the great thing is we got a, Jeremy got a direct message within five minutes from three people from the sales team to want to take a meeting with him. And that's the really exciting part about this thing. Jeremy, we just promoted you in, obviously. So he's connecting to the audio for a second. But the drift, the drift video basically inspired this idea that we wanted to get everyone set up in a way that you can align sales and marketing for your target accounts. You can align sales and marketing to do cool prospecting ideas. And uh, that's sort of what the theme of today is. It's not just going to be about sales and marketing alignment, but doing cool campaigns that are wrapped around your prospects and stuff. That's cool. Should we uh, introduce our guests? Yeah, I think we should. So uh, you guys can unmute your webcams if you want to show your faces off. If you don't want to, if you want to hide your face, it's okay. I understand. Um, I want to hide my face whenever I'm on a chat with Rishi anyway, all the time. <laughs> so mean. <laughs> no, no. So we've got, we've got Vincent a little bit unable to start video. Oh, well. well. <laughs> <laughs> you can't that, that, start your video because the host has stopped it. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we I guess, it. Jeremy, you want to start off? <laughs> so uh, everyone go around, just introduce yourselves and your roles at your companies that you work at so that people know the context of why people are talking about certain topics. Let's start with Jeremy. Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Jeremy Levier. I'm an account executive um, on our mid-market team here at Lead IQ. Um, and that's what I do. Um, and I was a BDR or SDR, whatever you want to call it, um, for like a year, a little over a year before um, I moved into the role here. And um, looking forward to jamming around some ideas and stuff that we've done here. Uh, let's let's roll to Nick next. Uh, Nick, you want to say hi? Hey, everyone. I'm a account executive at Demandbase. Uh, prior to that, I was part of the Engageo team. Uh, which was acquired by Demandbase about 60 days ago or so and spent uh, almost two years on the Engageo side as an account executive as well. All right, let's kick it over to Eva Jackson. Hi, all. Um, I'm Eva Jackson. I am the director of demand generation at PFL. So I'm excited to be joined here by Craig uh, on the PFL team. My team uh, is responsible for really every element of the buyer journey from customer marketing to channel marketing, uh, webinars, back when we were doing in-person events, those as well, uh, digital marketing. So really a lot of the span the gamut of marketing programs on my team. We'll pop over here. to, oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we'll pop cord over to Craig now. You want to talk, Craig, and tell people, who's this guy in this call? Why does he have a voice for radio? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> How funny. do you think that? <laughs> uh, yeah, Craig Boaz, uh, Director of Business Development at PFL. Uh, thrilled to work with talent like Eva and... Uh, and her team, my team is spread out in Indianapolis and in our, uh, in our HQ West over in Livingston, Montana, a little, little town right outside of Bozeman. And yeah, we're, uh, we're responsible for lead gen and setting up the AEs. And lastly, but, uh, you know, not least, let's, let's talk to Brandon Redlinger. Say, say hi, Brandon, tell people what you do. Hey guys, Brandon Redlinger here, um, head of demand gen at Demand Base. I also came from the Engageo team, so um, excited to join the Demand Base side. And Nick and I are still working together and, and going out and crushing it. It's it's a will they won't they thing with you two, isn't it? <laughs> 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 you probably will, which is good. Um, so to to kind of kick into this a little bit. What originally started, I'm going to give you the behind the scenes on the webinar a little bit and what this plan was originally and what it turned into. Um, so originally, we had this plan basically to get everyone here to do a prospecting campaign wrapped around the account executive. But the demand-based acquisition completely like <laughs> threw everything off. So we basically said, all right, just Lead IQ will do it to start with. Um, 
Before we kick into the, another example of working together and doing stuff with sales and marketing, I wanted to kind of figure out first, let's talk on the PFL side to start with. What are some ways that you guys work together marketing and sale, uh, marketing and sales, I guess? Because Craig, Craig's got the sales perspective and Eva's got the marketing perspective. Like, what's it like? What's the process like? How do you, do you guys talk regularly or is it just kind of just happen on its own? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Craig and I are really lucky in that um, marketing and BDR, BDRs roll up to marketing within the PFL org. So um, we both report to our CMO, Nick Runyon. Um, we that I think organically creates a lot of alignment because of, you know, being in management meetings together and we have a weekly meeting where we look at SQL performance. Uh, so there's a lot of natural crossover. And I think even everyone moving home and working remotely has driven even more alignment than I think before. Like we were already really well aligned, but um, I think there's been a lot of just organic kind of conversation and collaboration that has happened with people working from home. Uh, and that's across the team, CSMs, AEs, uh, really every department. What are some ways you guys work together? Do you want to speak to that, Craig? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, we work closely. So while I, I re- roll up to Nick in uh, in marketing, I, I'm kind of like Stretch Armstrong because I've got I've got the, the sales side pulling me to one side. I have the marketing side pulling me to the other. So I'm kind of that bridge in between uh, the two groups. But But yeah, Eva's group and I, Really, the whole marketing org really supports us with, you know, ICP with data enrichment and just making sure that that what we're calling on is ultimately going to set up the AEs, the CSMs, PFL in general uh, to be successful. And and you know, it's it's every day, multiple times a day. Eva and I are in in conversations. Then I'm going over working with the sales team and just really kind of the ebb and flow between the two orgs. Eva uh, at PFL, who decides what target accounts the BDR team goes after? Is it you, marketing or is it is it like is it just pulled out of nowhere or how do you guys figure it out? Yeah, it's a really collaborative process and Craig um Craig kind of piloted a MVP version of what we're ultimately using Engageo demand base for um when it comes to ICP routing. So uh we have what we call and Craig can expand on it, next best account. So um, all of our BDRs have a set amount of target accounts that are assigned to them each quarter. The marketing ops team kind of does that first round of uh, assignments and kind of vetting of accounts and then um, looking at criteria like engagement and ICP fit and um, existing contacts on the account, we're able to kind of prioritize those. Uh, and we've really used Engageo slash demand base. I don't know if you guys want me to like say one or the other, like, please yeah, let me what know. Do you but... call it? What do you guys call it now? What, what's the rule? Do you just not say Engageo anymore? You're like Engageo. You Demandio. 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 Yeah. Demandio. Got it. Cool. <laughs> So we use Demandio for <laughs> um, for routing uh, new lists of leads to so like webinar leads or um, you know other big lists that we get from partners uh, to the BDRs based on ICP fit or not. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say for a second, um, it's kind of funny. Some of you in this are probably going to get prospected by all three of our teams. Don't hate us, but <laughs> <laughs> that routing will happen through the demand based team. Um, Craig, do you guys look at only inbound leads as part of your target account list, or will you go find people that marketing's never engaged with before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so my team's got a few hundred accounts uh, per BDR. Uh, our our team has been as large as twenty four. We've 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 had to retract a little bit. As a lot of folks have had to do with, you know, work from home, COVID nineteen. Uh, just the remote workforce has allowed us to to really try to uh, really dial in better efficiencies. And and like everybody else, we really struggled when we went home because our job is lead gen. You know, global pandemic or not, our responsibility is to go generate leads. So we went through a lot of different uh, exercises with regards to new messaging uh, and, and really tried to dial that in. But but yeah, what we do is a lot of outbound. In fact, uh, fake number, but it's probably 95% outbound, 5% inbound at this point. Let's, let's, uh, that's, that's crazy. Let's, let's get the, the demand based perspective, I guess a little bit. So you two, obviously it's a little different cause you're on, you're an AE Nick um, yep. going through that process. Um What's what's the do AEs do outbound there or do you guys kind of hang around and wait for the SDRs and take it easy? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> that, that's a large part of my day. Um, the collaboration aspect, I think, is the best part though, because like the, when I first started at Engageo, the one of the first meetings I had was this thing called an ABM standup, and that was my you know, ABM marketer, her name was Sandra, my BDR, and I getting together every two weeks for a half hour, forty five minutes, kind of varied and. 
we're sitting down and collaborating on these accounts. And so I have a uh, uh, at Engageo, we had you know, territory based and we could sell up and down revenue wise, industry wise in that territory. So I had my patch of states. It's pretty large. <laughs> you know, we had our ICP, our best fit based on like size and industry and tech stack and stuff that we'd narrow it down to. But there's definitely hundreds, if not thousands of accounts. And so my BDR and I, yes, we get inbound leads, but we strategize with marketing to find who are those top tier of accounts. And then maybe if they're not even on our radar, like, yes, I'd love to have these 25 customers or, or companies as my customers, but are those the ones who we should be spending time with? And so that engagement metric was something that we used as like a sounding off point for uh, outbound, but it definitely is a majority. It's a majority outbound. You, you can't just be living and dying off the inbound lead. You'll be, you'll be sitting there for a while. <laughs> for, the, for the people that are afraid of, let's pretend that you're one of those people that's like, I'm too deep now and I can't ask what this is. Um, <laughs> Actually, it kind of reminds me of a story. We had an employee that we hired and I didn't know their name and their Zoom account. They like were the team name. And I did like five meetings with this person reoccurring five weeks in a row. And by the fifth week, I was like, crap, I, I got to just tell them I don't know their name yet, even though we've done this meeting. And it was really and bad. And then when he asked me for my name, I said, Rishi, he said, all right, Ricky. <laughs> <keep going." laughs> um, I want to, I want to ask the demand base guys, can you tell us like what ABM really is? Like some people probably know the term in here and like, Oh, account-based marketing and stuff. But like, what's the actual execution of that? Like, like, what is it? Looking at you, Brando. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so like account, account-based to me is all about like multiple team, multiple people on your team going after multiple people, people on their team. Um, and they're longer deal cycle cycles. They are larger deals, and it's just a team approach, right? So a lot of traditional demand gen is about going after individual leads, whereas, sure, like we we care about leads still in account in the account based world, but like we care more about the account first, and then delivering mm-hmm. specific relevant messaging to those people. So you're you're choosing the accounts first, rather than a lot of times people are like, all right, what's the what's the new fun campaign that we're going to do? And then like, let's just blast it out there. We're actually going to kind of turn that around a little bit and say, all right, let's actually take a look at the people who are um, more likely to buy, who have a high propensity uh, to buy software like ours. And then let's create the campaigns around that. So I'm working with Nick all the time. I'm working with the SDRs all the time to figure out who are the right people to go after and then what's the message that is most relevant to them and it's it's threading a lot of our campaigns together it's not just a direct mail campaign it's not just abm ads it's not just cold calling you have to really loop all that together so that you do have a pretty cohesive experience and then if someone comes in later in a deal cycle you know a lot of times CMO comes in late. We don't want the BDR to be like, "Hey, like, want a demo?" They're already deep into a sales cycle. Mm-hmm. So we just need to make sure that everyone on our team knows what's happening at that account. So uh, on the PFL end, you guys do a lot of stuff with direct mail. Obviously, that's like a really powerful engine here. How does that work? So you is it? What inspires the idea first? Is it? I have these target accounts, let's send them this cool thing I found, or is it like, how does it, what's the process like? How does that even happen? Yeah, it's a little bit of um, a hybrid approach. I mean, we take a similar uh, kind of look at our, our target accounts and who we want to target and tier them out based on, uh, you know, expected deal value, how many contacts we believe we'll need to engage to move a specific account forward. Um, we also have more programmatic ABM programs that uh, are highly based on, you know, maybe two to three to five contacts per account, just kind of starting to build engagement uh, with those organizations. And for some of those uh, programs, we generally look at things like what focus vertical on our ICP are we targeting? Like where, what's the level of warmth within the organization? How much do we want to spend on this account um, at, since it's more of a scaled approach? So it really does vary. And Brandon, your point around kind of looking at the account first and then uh, using that to inform. For us, a lot of it is direct mail, but really any element of a channel marketing strategy. So that's uh, ads, that's landing page copy, that's really every touch that they may get, um, you really do have to start with what's the desired outcome for moving this account forward. Uh, so at least from the marketing this, I, perspective, that's what we I, look at. I got to ask this question. I'm sorry. 
What's the most expensive thing you guys have ever mailed to someone? Oh, that was my question. <laughs> I was going to say coolest. <laughs> Man, that's interesting. Craig, any thought? Like, what can from you a From a BDR perspective or just in general? Yeah, yeah. Like, what's, yeah. The, what's like, all right, we're going to send this. All right, uh, I'll tell you a cool like, do story. Do you guys ever this, send a private jet to anyone's house? As like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell yeah. a story about it, our it's first. It's on its I'll way, tell, Rishi. It's on its way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> our first episode of B2B Tonight, we did with Stu Heineck. And Stu Heineck wrote a book, How to Get a Meeting with Anyone. In the book, he tells the story of a guy I actually met years ago in South Carolina. His name is Dan Walshman. Dan actually went and looked at... Uh, he wanted to get into Fortune 500 companies to do consulting for them. So Dan uh, somehow got the connection of the guy that made all the swords for the movie Gladiator. And he had that guy make swords with the CEO's oh names engraved on them and sent them to the CEOs. Oh and apparently gosh. the legend in the book is that he only didn't get a meeting with two of them. And that's because both of them didn't receive the sword. And someone stole their packages. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the legend is that he had like a 98% response rate or something when he did it or yeah, 99% response rate to it. Yeah. I wish I had a sword. Um, I'd have to wear goggles while you see it because I got to protect my eyes. But um, <laughs> obviously, PFL hasn't said that. But like, what's like, do you guys have anything that you can think of that's like, yeah, this was cool that we said? The first one that comes to mind on my end, and Craig, I'd be interested in your perspective, but um, we had a customer once who sent as kind of a meeting maker campaign whiskey rocks. And then if the client took the meeting, they got a like personalized branded, like with their name on it, bottle of Woodford. Um, which was pretty. Is that, a, is that alcohol? I'm it really is. Late. It's alcohol. Okay. 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 I don't drink. I don't Ryan know. People don't drink. Know, I don't drink, so I don't yes. know that stuff. Yeah. 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 It's a very. It's a nice whiskey. Um, Unless you talk about Propel, he's out of the game. <laughs> hey, Propel, we can do that too. Sponsor. Branded Propel. I, I, yeah. I, I, I drink. I drink child's uh, soccer fuel. I guess <laughs> is what they'd call it. This is like what kids drink at soccer practice. Um. So you said you said that did, Craig was that your team that did the sending, like that responded and followed up. That was a no, customer no, no, of ours no. yeah. um, who did that campaign. We yeah, so we have kits. Uh, we have we have kits, and we control the inventory for each BDR. So they kind of have their own uh, what we call swag IQ, their own little personal marketing center that they can go in and, and pull from. And we have anything from flat mailers that are just information. We send a lot of that stuff out to uh, you know your your financial services, your health insurance companies, things where they can't receive quote unquote gifts. Where we also have like the sock kits, you know, that are a little little bit more expensive, but still kind of you know a good good aha moment, good meeting maker. But then we also have. $60, $70 mug and gummy kind of packages. So depending on engagement and depending on who it is and what we're trying to, to, to send, who we're trying to reach, each BDR is sort of empowered to decide what they want to what they want to ship out. So there's uh, a what? question from TJ Houston. How are you guys dealing with shipping issues related to coronavirus? And are people supplying home addresses? Yes and yes. So <laughs> uh, the first one was, was how are we dealing with shipping issues? So we have a, we're, we're one of the top 10 customers in the United States for FedEx. We really have zero issues with FedEx. On occasion, we'll see a day extra delay than the, the normal, you know, one to two, three to four day shipping. Most of that has not been coronavirus related though. Most of that has been related to, uh, unrest in larger cities with uh, with with different protests and and things of that nature, which has slowed down some of the shipments coming into the cities, but that's minimal for us. And as far as finding uh, uh, home addresses, preferred mailing addresses, whatever you want to call it, you know, remote worker addresses, we fought that early on. I've just kind of a great story to tell, but we fought it early on and we've sort of dialed in a, a, a pretty slick way to do it and, and to do it efficiently per BDR. If we have to be journalists here, what is that way? <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Hard hitting question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, so first, I, I guess I'll say like, you know, mid-May or mid-March, everybody went home, right? And just and nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody really knew what to do, what the messaging should say, how much do you sell, how much do you consult? And, and you know, it was just kind of a, a nightmare for all of us, I think. Eva and her team created some initial landing pages for a couple different events, but also we, we 
we made some changes. So it was a landing page for the BDR. So as we were getting communication out and updating all of our messaging, uh, and again, sort of brute force, right? Phone calls, emails, LinkedIn messaging, pushing people to this landing page, we saw some success early. And while it was success, it, it didn't offset what we needed as far as SQL creation. So we had to come up with new ways. So it was more dials. It was more emails. It was just, it was literally just brute force, head through the wall. Like, like it, we were just struggling, I think, like everybody else. And then about mid-May, it hit us like, we're overthinking this. I have a team of 12 BDRs. They're sharp. They're smart folks. What if we just challenge them to go find home addresses through free online tools? There's tons of stuff out there. Family tree, something, something, whitepages.com. Outside of names like Mike Smith or Jason Jones, things that are like, oh gosh, there's got to be a thousand of these people in every little town. Most people are identifiable through some social networking, through LinkedIn, going to white pages and looking up towns and, and, and trying to figure out like, is this it? And what we did is we created then sequences that would say, hey, Ryan, I really want you to experience PFL. We're using some third-party you know, data appending. Not sure if this is accurate. Do you live at 123 Main Street? If not, could you let me know a better address? Because I'm assuming you're not working from the office. Let me know what you think. Uh, and then either tell me directly, go to this landing page, uh, or tell me to leave you alone. Very few people were offended. Very few people were freaked out. On occasion, you'll get somebody that's like, don't send me anything. I don't want, you're creeping me out. A lot of folks were like, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. I don't know how you found me, but that's like, what's the secret sauce? It's like, well, why don't we just have a conversation and let's talk about PFL. Let's talk about direct mail. Let's talk about how we can help you hit those 2020 goals. And oh, by the way, I gotcha. I, I gotcha. I'm doing what you wish your lead gen team was doing. And all we were doing is just empowering our reps to go out and find the stuff. But we would make sure that we would send that same message multiple times because you just didn't want to do like a one blast. Hey, I'm going to send you something. You really wanted to drive some engagement because what a lot of people did, which was really kind of nice for us. Hey, don't worry about sending me anything. I get it. Let's go ahead and have a conversation. Cheaper route, more efficient. We didn't have to wait for, for deliveries. I know we do have a question. Someone is asking about landing pages. We'll get to that in a second. But I, I wanted to kind of, what before we get to that question, um, on our end, so we did this campaign. The idea was that we were going to post five videos online uh, to prospects. Jeremy picked the accounts. Um, and Jeremy, talk about the campaign a little bit. And then we'll talk about, we ran into the same issue where we didn't know how to get home addresses and we kind of just panicked. Um, which is one of the reasons I wanted to ask you that in this webinar. Jeremy, do you want to talk a little bit about what you did? Um, yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, so there was um, basically we picked five target accounts and, um, you know, what we were planning on doing for direct mail was like if they replied, um, you know, and they engaged back, then we would try to get an address to, to send something to, like if they took a meeting. Um, initially we were going to do combine direct mail, but also like the main piece that we were going to do was a very highly customized, personalized video, um, for, for the prospect. Um, you know, and, and we had done this before. So, you know, last year we had made really highly customized, personalized videos for a certain target account and posted the videos on LinkedIn and even tagged the prospect in the um, in the LinkedIn post. We did three of them last year, all three booked meetings and two of them are now customers. Um, so, you know, we had really good success with it. Obviously three is, you know, smaller sample size. So we try, we, we we're gonna try it with five um, this time around. Um, when we posted them this time around though, um, on, on LinkedIn and tagged the prospect, um, the first one, they actually, <laughs> They actually got upset because they were getting blown up with all these notifications on LinkedIn that um, all of these people were commenting. Like the first video, literally, it's the had first. Like, it's it was maybe the first time ever that we've done that and someone got upset. And it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I we actually heard it and we were like, oh crap! All in the history of the campaigns of doing social videos where we put something out and just tag the prospect, um, we've always put a disclaimer. 
And we didn't this time. We didn't think about doing that. We were just, we had a new process. So like, I think that might've played a factor too. Richie, do you want to actually play one of the videos? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Wait, hey, Jeremy, which one did you get an op with? I'm playing that one um, right now. Should I say the name of the company? Well, we'll see. You're going to say it in the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna, we're going to say it in the, in the video anyway. So um, the company is called Meta Compliance. Um, okay. and, Can you guys uh, see it? Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is one that we did specifically for this webinar to do this experiment with people about sales and marketing alignment. The following is a short prospecting video for the fine folks at Meta Compliance. This message was created without Meta Compliance's notice, consent, or awareness, but was crafted with love by the team here at Lead IQ, and we hope to speak to you soon. Lead IQ presents a special video for Meta Compliance. Ah, yes, Keith. Keith Robinson from Meta Compliance. I'd like to schedule a meeting with you. We're both connected to Richard Smith from Refract. One of our customers here at Lead IQ and a great champion, so definitely feel free to ask him about how many more meetings their team has booked by using our phone number data and getting in touch with more prospects, even in the UK. Speaking of the UK, you'd like to know that here, I'm based in New Hampshire, where we apparently just steal all of the town names that you folks have in the UK, including Derry and Londonderry, right down the street from here. So we just copy the map that you folks have when coming up with our town names. But I look forward to speaking with you soon about all of that stuff. Good day. This has been a special video for Meta Compliance, presented by Lead IQ. Was my voice, by the way, I was the voiceover guy. How how how'd I do? Uh, you're okay, but I would like to know. Jeremy did all that in one breath. I, <laughs> he still hasn't taken a breath from it. Um, kudos, by the way, to Nick, our producer, for editing that too and do, shooting it with the zoom in and stuff. Um, Nick right now is eating a burrito, but when he comes back to us, so the original scheme, the original scheme was going to be to make the video. If they don't respond, send a package to them, and if they do respond, send the package to them anyway. Um, so now that we know how to get home addresses, we're going to have to go do that, which I'm really excited about. Someone did ask in the chat, um, what do you guys use for landing page technology so that you can ask for a home address and stuff? Hold on. It was actually directed to Eva first. So let's ask her and then we'll go around. Okay. Because I'm such an expert on landing pages. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we use Marketo and uh, I think that really any landing page creation software um, is suitable for capturing preferred address. I think it's the more important thing that we've paid attention to um, at PFL. And we kind of couple the BDR's very direct approach with research, which candidly, I was very skeptical. And Craig knows this. I was like, people are going to get mad. Like, <laughs> I just figured that people just based on past experience would be really salty about getting things at home. But it's actually surprised me, which I, is awesome and a, a huge learning for us. So um, we kind of couple that direct approach with more automated programs to capture for her preferred address. So um, email streams or webinars is a really great um, tactic for us to use to capture preferred address. And uh, really, the more important thing is just making sure when you do that capture um, in a landing page that you're very clear about how that data is going to be used. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest kind of tip that we've we've understood is like, you know, you have to make sure it's very clearly stated that you're only going to use it one time, or if you want it to be used more than once, like making sure that opt-in language is super clear. So um, that's been the big kind of important tactic on our end to kind of couple with the BDR outreach. Yeah, um, that, sorry to interrupt you, but we no, put that in no. the initial language, like, hey, we think this is your address. Could you verify it for us, by the way? If it is, we're not going to house it in our CRM. We're just going to use it one time. What we're trying to do is break through the digital clutter, give you a moment, have you experienced PFL. And while Eva was was nervous, you know, you got to go back mm -hmm. now, was it nine, 10 weeks? Uh, the willingness now from prospects as we learn this new norm, people are more willing to just say like, yeah, yeah totally. I used to have an office. Now I don't. I'm in my guest bedroom. So, yep, that works. Just don't house it. You know, don't solicit to me other ways. Just, you know, be cool. And Jeremy, back to you. I know you you were talking about, you know, you were just testing with five. I wanted to put some context around what I was talking about from that sort of brute force, what we were doing initially. And and then we piloted using those free online tools. I, I just wanted to give sort of the the panel here some understanding. We had we had put two thousand people from mid March through mid May 
through some sort of email, phone call, LinkedIn cadence. We piloted 300 people using like a whitepages.com approach. Uh, we converted 1% of our 2,000. And with the 300 people, uh, yeah, 300 prospects, we converted 10%. So we made 30 appointments on those 300 compared to the 20 appointments on the 2,000. So mathematically, 300 is not greater than 2,000, but it was. And, and the difference was we were sending direct mail and people were impressed. So I'm going to I'm going to get the demand based perspective on this. So you guys saw Jeremy's meta compliance video. Talk to us if you were coming to an organization like Weed IQ like what's the I don't know if it's going to be Nick or, or Brandon you guys can rock paper scissors or something but what's the play how do we get how do we get the awesome cool content that Jeremy made to align with the marketing team? How do we get it played with the marketing team? Like what's the how do we actually take that video and get it so meta compliance people can see it? besides just cold email and cold outreach, is there other stuff that you can do? Go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> good good, good <laughs> no, <I'm> question. <laughs> I'll tell you no, one I'm... of my favorite campaigns that we did, um, uh, which might be kind of an interesting idea. Like, And it was a good story of how marketing and sales collaborated. So there's a summit, uh, this Topo Summit, which I'm sure all you guys have, have heard of and been to. And Craig Rosenberg and Brandon are like good buddies. Uh, they, they do a lot of content together. So we created a uh, like a fathead, like stand-up cardboard cutout of Craig Rosenberg. And we put it on our booth, next to our booth. And everyone was coming by and taking pictures. And Craig you know, came over and like put his arm around himself and like shared it on social media. And it got a ton of traffic and a ton of awareness. Um, and what we did for Serious Decisions, uh, Brandon and I had this idea, was this campaign called find your, hashtag find your face. And so there was so much interest generated from that little cardboard cutout of Craig that we decided to say, how can we spin this up to like improve upon that, but scale it a little bit? Cause it's not just Craig to like our prospects. And so there's, there's four of us going to serious decisions on the rep side. And so we each picked five prospects. We just took their, I think Brandon was like their LinkedIn photo or something like that. And yep. we sent that to get printed and we put their faces. It was kind of like, you know, like the size of a basketball, maybe obviously flat. And we put it all over our booth at serious decisions and people are walking by and they're oh. like, why is my face on your booth? And it's like, you're the exact person I wanted to talk to. We had, so there's 20 faces, uh -huh. 20 people, all 20 of them stopped by two people. Didn't like it. One, one person really didn't like it. <laughs> the other <laughs> person was like, this is weird. Can you please take this down? But nice try kind of thing. But the other 18, we, we booked meetings with, all 18 of those companies, we closed four of those deals and they were all CMOs or VPs of these, you know, top tier accounts for us. I mean, that was like, that was probably one of my favorite things that, that we did at Engageo. Yeah, hundred percent. I love <laughs> that one so much because like, you don't, you don't actually know if a lot of those people are going to Sirius, yeah. but you know, they have people there. So we had a ton of people who were like, Hey, that's my boss. Can I take that and take yeah. a picture with mm -hmm. my boss? So they're, they're, taking that and they either tweeting it out or they're just sending an email directly to their boss. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other piece of that was, um, yeah, we, we took a picture of the, of the, uh, the booth where we had all the faces up there and just said, can you find your face? And on the back of them, we said, you either win $25 gift card or could win some uh, nice Beats head, headphones. So they actually had incentive to come by. Yeah. Uh, and then we just, we tagged them on social. Um, we even did follow up emails. Um, hey, it's the last day, last chance to come find your face and potentially win some headphones. So that, that campaign killed it for us. Again, best part, they didn't even have to be there. They had a lot of people who just thought it was a fun campaign who then took pictures of it, shared it spread like wildfire in their own company. I think the human, like the human aspect, and now more than ever, we've probably realized that like the last five months or whatever, but like, you just have to be like, look, I really want to talk to you. You're probably getting a hundred emails a day from people wanting your time. I'm going to think outside the box to get it in a fun way. It's like, yeah, I put your face on my booth. Like joke about it. Be cool. You know, like thinking, like thinking in that human, like human type of way and trying to connect with someone. Um, I think people at least appreciate um, the effort anyways, like it took a lot of time to put your face on this booth, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to find, like find good pictures of you. And like, we you sent your face out to get printed and like print it out, then cut those out. We cut them out, put it on yeah. the, 
we we had the we had the paint store sticks that we we glued them to the back of yeah. and then put it on our <laughs> it was a yeah. lot of work but it, it was very effective totally one of the ways that we promoted jeremy's video was we would all, like he posted on his account but we'd also post it on the lead iq social accounts mm -hmm. and uh what we did is I'm not trying to plug our product. You can use a competitor. I don't care. Um, you do built, care. You do wait, care. Wait, wait, hold on. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, listen, listen. That, that, that's neither here or there. But what we did is we took a list of people that worked at these different companies and we captured them from LinkedIn Sales Navigator with their titles and the function being sales. And I built a really quick list of all these people one of the things that we can do, you can do it too, but it's a little bit like more customized. We didn't just get their work emails. We also got their personal emails. And we took that information, threw it into a CSV, and we uploaded that onto social for a target audience and built the target audience for it so that anyone that was at Meta Compliance was also seeing on Facebook a video for Meta Compliance. Mm. Um, with the, and we, on LinkedIn, we promoted, or on Facebook, we promoted the post. Um, primarily because we had a lot of engagement for the post. On LinkedIn, we promoted it right to the company. And uh, I, the actual response came from Jeremy emailing them afterward, wasn't it, Jeremy, or DMing them after? Or how did it actually well, get the meeting afterward? Yeah, because, you know, um, basically, as, as I was explaining earlier, you know, we um, had one person that they got upset that, you know, they were getting all these notifications. And um, then the second one that we posted on LinkedIn he didn't get upset, but this other company, um, he just just removed the tag. He just clicked in LinkedIn to untag himself from that post. So we we're like, okay, over for 2 here. Um, and then so for the remaining three videos, I just emailed them. You know, I just I just emailed them uh, the, the videos, and one of those three was was Meta Compliance. So he replied to the email, and um, you know, he was like, Jeremy, I think you might be crazy, but this is awesome. I just emailed this video to our entire sales org and let's schedule a call for next week. And, you know, it's a highly qualified opportunity in the pipeline now. Um, you know, and, and there was another video I sent somebody else um, a while ago, a similar type of response they got, like, you know, one, you know, where the guy replied back, he was like, I sent him a guitar video where I'm playing a guitar and I don't even know how to play the guitar. I was like, it's, ter it's maybe right. the worst thing in the world that anyone in this room could watch. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it's so good that it's bad. It's so bad that it's good. Yeah. And so <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Reply, it's like VP of sales strategy and operations. He was like, this video is, I don't know. Can I swear? It, he said, yeah. this video is fucking hilarious. And you know, he sent it to his whole sales org. They're now a customer of ours. Um, yeah. Somebody else replied to one of my guitar videos and, and they said, Jeremy, I don't know. I, I think you might be crazy, but I saw this video and I, you know, I thought you might be crazy, but like, I have to meet this guy. I have to meet, I have to meet with him. And she scheduled the call and that converted into a customer as well. So um, by the way, we did, we did a, um, for people that are wondering, we surveyed all of our leader Q customers. We do a lot of cool stuff like this with experiments with prospecting with marketing and sales, helping each other. We emailed our customers last year and did a survey on how they heard about lead IQ. And uh, literally some of these videos that Jeremy put, I think we had over 15% of our customers have heard of us from Jeremy, <laughs> like just doing these things and, and getting buzz and doing this. You have, Mark, this if you're in this raise. company, I have, to, I have to ask for a raise now after we get off this, <laughs> after this webinar. If you, if you, if you really put your AEs front and center, think about them from this perspective, who's better at talking than Nick and Jeremy, like, and, and Craig on this, like I'm bumbling around trying to figure it out. Rishi's literally doing something else right now. He's doing a Sudoku puzzle. I don't play asteroids. <laughs> but I got to do a Sudoku puzzle. Just, I can't play asteroids. Yeah, I can't. Your reps, are, your reps are literally talented talkers that are meant to be in these things. And you should get your reps to do these things. Have them be on webinars. Have them participate in stuff. Uh, it's one of the things I really actually like about Demand Base too. Um, I went to uh, dinner at Dreamforce a couple of years ago from you guys and got like a free... I know it was before when you guys didn't work there, but... Um, got a steak dinner, hung out and talked to people. And the speaker that came up and talked to everyone wasn't a VP. It was literally an account executive. And I love that. Like, I was like, that's so great that they did something like that with field marketing. Um, Rishi, so do you want to tackle some of the questions? Yeah, we got a couple of questions here. Uh, this one's from Harjit Singh. And this was for, I think, for Craig earlier. How did you figure out those ABM accounts? Were they SALs or MQLs? Uh, that's a good question. So really they started out just as simply uh, ICP fit. Uh, we just 
we just looked at the macro list and said, okay, what does our what do our best customers look like? How do we go find more of them? And and literally, uh, literally scraped for size, revenue, tech stack, vertical. Then then we compress down from there and and build campaigns around mainly industry. Um, so so the really the MQL comes after it's all built, right? And after we start we start prospecting. I think going off of that, going off of that point, like when I think about ABM, it's going to get the people that you, going to get in front of the people who you want to talk to, because in reality, like, of course, I would love to talk to this chief marketing officer of every one of my prospects, but that's not going to happen. Like those guys aren't just casually browsing your websites or popping into a webinar, unfortunately. And so you have to build the story of all these little pieces, even if it's pre MQ, you know, like things that happen that wouldn't qualify a lead, like someone came to Engageo.com and then left. That's all they did. Like, I'm going to follow up on that, but I'm going to use that person who might be a manager or director to then go email the CMO or the VP about what we do and why we do it well and stuff like that. So I think to Craig's point, like it is about finding the ICP fit and then like go get those people because they're not likely going to come to you (laughs) Uh, most of the time anyways. Unfortunately. On on our end... um... I'll, one of the things that we recently implemented was we built lead grades and grades are different than lead scores. It's basically a criteria of things that don't change. So a lead comes in, your head count's not going to change that much. Your annual revenue is not going to change that much. Um, your title very rarely changes. Your function doesn't change. Those are different things that will go into a lead grade for us. And we have separate workflows based on the lead grade that comes in. Uh, that will trigger us. And if we see something come in, a trigger like it upsets us, I guess, um, that will trigger us. And if we see something come in that has a good lead grade, that becomes a priority for us to put something together. One of the things we don't do yet, and I'm sure it sounds like PFL is really good at this, by the way, with your weekly meetings that you guys do. We don't really get together and jam and say, how do we break into these accounts? And I, I we used to, it was easier when we were all in one office, but since we've gone remote, I definitely think we've gotten siloed. It sounds like that's an effective strategy here. So if you're looking for a takeaway of that, get with your team and do a weekly brief on like, these are some five, these are five accounts we really want to break into. What can we do? Like we did that with Jeremy for this webinar, but if we weren't doing this webinar, Jeremy, I don't even know if that conversation would have ever happened, right? Yeah, maybe not. (laughs) It makes me sad. Um, What what are the other questions someone asked is what's your favorite item to ship? Jeremy actually has a really cool story. Uh, Do you want to share the story, Jeremy, about the... The guy that got married. Um, <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I said to me, I, I don't even know what I would what I, where I would go with that one. We'll leave the comedy to you, Rishi. Um, I mean, I have a few things that I could talk about there. Um, one was a cutting board. So you know, this prospect before being able to um, take a meeting, um, their VP of sales was on his honeymoon, and um, so I was like, hmm, maybe a wedding gift without being weird. Um, and so, you know, um, I thought like maybe a cutting board, that's something you might get somebody as, as a wedding gift. Um, and so I found one that, you know, and this person's last name is O'Reilly. So very Irish. Um, and there was a cutting board that I found, um, that, um, you know, you can inscribe it with the person's last name. You just type in their last name. It'll be on the cutting board. And the I in O'Reilly had a I had an Irish clover, um, you know, and so that was like, I think 40 bucks, but it turned into like a $20,000 deal for us. Um, so that was one. And then like, I had a few prospects that I noticed, like literally all at the same time, I was like, Whoa, what's going on here with all the babies being made. <laughs> Cause like all, all of a sudden people were being, were out of office for paternity leave or maternity leave or any other, those other earnities. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and so my fiance is very crafty. She's not in sales, but she does like arts and crafts and stuff um, as like a hobby. And so she made onesies. Like sometimes she'll make, you know, personalized, customized onesies for people with like something that she like puts on the onesie. That's like, you know, whatever. I don't know how she does it, but um, so we put the company's, you know, logo. We took that, you know, we did it for, I think three or four accounts um, and put the company's logo on the onesie and then like a little, you know, subtle, um, lead IQ, tiny logo here on the shoulder. And it was on a baby onesie and mailed those out to, um, to the prospects. And, uh, 
I'm pretty sure like all of those converted to meetings, like, like all four of them. And one of those people even posted it on LinkedIn. Like they took a picture of the onesie and they posted it on LinkedIn. They're like, Oh my God, this is so cool. You know, this is what all SDRs should be doing. Cause at the time I was an SDR. Um, so yeah, that's a couple of cool stories. Brandon and I do what? that a lot. The onesies. That's a, a good one. I think you the guys, I is, you already knew about it before. No, we do that. We <laughs> I've talked about those. it on like other podcasts and webinars and like, you may have saw the LinkedIn post, but yeah, yeah. you may have done it. Me. The onesies know. are awesome. I think like the best gifts are always the personal ones. Like I can talk exactly. for a long time for those, but like a good standard, like mass personalization is we do print the, our, our mascot at Engageo was like a whale named Geo. And it was kind of this cartoon little guy. So we made a baby. His name is Geo because whales, I guess are in pods and our mascot's name is anyways. Uh, so we put this little baby Geo on this onesie and we had blue ones and pink ones. And so to that point, like customers, prospects, whatever door opener, or like just a, Hey, checking in congrats on the, on the newborn. That was something that we could kind of order in, you know, mass, so to speak, and still make it feel like it's personal. So we didn't take it as far as you did with their, like the prospects logo on the front. We did the mm -hmm. Engageo logo, but that's, that's, that worked all the time. People are super appreciative of that. Yeah, I, I like to take respirators and put lead IQ logos on them and just send them out to everybody. <laughs> what a good guy. I wonder if anyone's done just, that. <laughs> what are you to say, Eva? No, it's just notable to me through all these conversations around the item that it really isn't about what the item is. It's about that personal kind of effort that went into identifying what this person cares about at the time and how do you use that to create like a brand connection or speak to the pain that they're looking for. Um, Nick, you mentioned it's all about kind of creating those human connections right now. And that's definitely more true than ever. So um, I think we all have favorite items, but, and, you know, I can nerd out about items in a box all day <laughs> being, <laughs> uh, you know, integrating direct mail into a lot of our programs, but it really is all about that message and, and forming that human connection with the person. Yeah. And, and just, you know, when, when you, I'm talking about, you know, 2000 people being prospect. I mean, we're prospecting hundreds a week, new people, putting them in long sequences and trying to, to drop orchestrated mail in there. It really isn't about the thing. It's about the experience. And, you know, we personalize the card that's inside the box that has the same pair of socks that we have thousands that are being shipped out, you know, over the course of a year. What is cool for us is, is because we work so closely with, with FedEx, the minute we find out that the box has been delivered, not the minute, but within 15 minutes of the box being delivered, my BDRs get a notification from FedEx saying, hey, Rishi just got his box. Boom. Now you're on the phone going, hey, I'm mm -hmm. the guy that sent you the thing. And it's like, wow, that's the orchestration. That's, the, that's that memorable, very personalized, very hyper-targeted, which is you know, part, of what we, part of what we sell. Yeah, one so, question I have on that, though, is like, um, and I have this question, too, sometimes when I get when I do direct mail and have stuff delivered to people, um, I'll sometimes wait, like, because is it I mean, and you might you probably know better, because if you work really closely with FedEx, like they that package is delivered, but maybe that person wasn't home, you know, or is it you only do that if it's the type of package where they have to sign it? You know, so they signed off on the package. So, you know, physically they were holding that package because sometimes like if I don't know that I get I, I, I have something delivered, I get the email saying they, you know, that that thing was delivered. I'll usually wait a, a day or two because maybe they're like not home or something. And then I call them and they're like, what are you talking about? I didn't get that. And they might not get it for a couple of days. So what do you guys do with that? It's different working from home versus working in an office. In an office, yeah, a lot of times people will say, I didn't get anything. Yeah. I, you know, you don't want to argue. Well, I got a notification. You're lying. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> that it's sitting in a mail room and it'll be yeah. there in a day or two or, hey, I'm out of the office, but it's probably on my desk. I'll see it in a couple of days. Those are the conversations that we've had historically. Now, when they say, I don't know what you're talking about, it's like, well, go, go check your front door and call mm -hmm. me back or go check your front door. I'll call you in 10 minutes. The, the timeliness for us is actually th really part of the aha moment. Like, yeah. whoa, that like, should I be creeped out or is that just, is that just technology at its finest? And, and that's mm -hmm. really what we try to leverage is don't wait a day or two. The novelty is wearing off that, mm -hmm. that, that moment in time is wearing off. So we're, we're like, drop what you're doing and make the dial. <laughs> okay. I cool. think we're all lucky too, that we were everyone on this call markets to marketers in some way. And I think 
because we are trying to find those innovative approaches, we're probably the least skeptical uh, group of people you could reach out to because we're like, oh, we see what you're doing. All right. I'll bite. Tell me more. People like feel like I'm adopting this. (laughs) Right. Like like the onesie, right? People are like, I'm doing this now. Thank you. (laughs) It's like, okay. Yeah. So I don't mean to be that guy, but I'm going to be, we have five more minutes um, on this webinar. So damn it, Rishi. (laughs) <laughs> you are that guy. If people have questions, <laughs> if you want to ask questions to the fine panel that we've put together today, um, it's basically this. It, we basically have put together the the cast of Friends getting back together. I don't know why this doesn't have more people in it. Uh, to be honest, that's who Craig looks like, Chandler. Oh my god, it makes so much sense. <laughs> that's so weird. Um, I um, here's what I was going to say too. So we talked about alignment. We've talked about doing things together. We talked about getting your sales talent in front of your customers and using them also for marketing tactics as well. Um, What's, what's the foundational reason you guys think that sales and marketing have problems? Like why, why is this happening at all these companies? Cause we have a lot of people that came to this webinar today that want to know this stuff. This is a big problem. What starts it? Is it just this preconceived stigmatism toward each other? I don't know if stigmatism, that's an I thing, but stigma against someone like, how does it happen and how do we fix it? Because that's really the big takeaway we want people to have today. Well, I, I feel like the biggest thing is the golden comp on different things, right? Or, right? Like what, what motivates people more than money? Not, not too many things. And, you know, rep is pay to close deals. A lot of times marketers are paid to get more leads. They are measured on how many downloads they got from the ebook. Um, not necessarily do those people actually matter? Are they be part of our ICPs? Are they target accounts? So I think one thing that you know has worked well at Engageo and at Demandbase now too is just like Nick knows that I, I look at of the people who download my ebook, like how many people are on my target account, and of those target accounts, like how many people are within the ICP. So he knows that it's going to be a solid pipeline. Um, so I'm, I'm always looking at, are they quality? Like it, it's not, it's not a quantity game. Sure. It, it feels good to hit, you know, a thousand downloads in a day or two, but like, I care more about, are they the right people? But you had to brag that you had a thousand downloads. The things <laughs> I do for a thousand downloads. I just get really sad <laughs> gravelly. Um, you, what, you know, what, I, I, oh, I, I would go maybe uh, you brought up like comp and something like that. I, I think business philosophy has a lot to do with it as well because that can influence trust. So when I look at like my past, where I've been and, and the, the, the departments I've worked with, you kind of look at like, what can I control? And do I really want to give that up to someone else who might not be compensated and or have the same KPIs that I have? And so can I trust this person? And luckily when I joined PFL, everything was kind of out on the table. And it was like, this is what we do and this is how we work. And, 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 and it's a very tiered approach, you know, and it's very much a, you have to trust your brothers and sisters in this group and in that group. And you've got to be a conduit and you actually just, everybody has to work together. And if you don't have that trust, really PFL is not a good place for you. And so I knew that coming in. I, I, um, I think one thing that I'm kind of realizing that has helped me a lot, we've grown a lot in the past two years. Like we've grown like six X and we have, how do we get in meetings now with people I don't know uh, and don't know what's going on? Uh, the other day I thought I was talking to a vendor and it was someone that was on like a different team. <laughs> um, uh, we're setting up all our security stuff and had to go with one of the IT people and I didn't know. Um, I think you need to make time for sales if you're in marketing. And if you're in sales, you need to make time for marketing. Like that's one of the most basic things. Have the marketers come to an SDR stand up once a week. Have the sales reps meet with the marketing leaders once a week. Uh, have marketing leaders meet with sales leaders once a week. I think the problem is like, we're all so busy and head down on getting things done with our own goals and OKRs and stuff that we don't actually make time for each other anymore. And then you get on a meeting and you shrug and don't know what to talk about. That meeting's important. Even if it's just on a human level, dealing with stuff, I think we need to just open up with each other. My sales leader, Tyler, and our team should be like a therapist to me. And I should be his therapist a little bit. I've got father issues. I could talk about these things with him. <laughs> no, all, kid, all kidding aside, though, and I know Rishi has <laughs> deep-seated father issues. That's why he asked me how to tie his tie. Um, it, it really is important to make time for each other. I think that's a really important thing here, too. 
Well, Ryan, I'll just give you a, a, a sort of an exclamation point to that statement. Our VP of sales just sent Eva and I a message essentially like he has to hop off. He's been listening. So so just right there alone, we, we are being supported in this effort by our VP of sales, the guy who I spend a ton of time with. Like That's the other side of the Stretch Armstrong, right? I'm with Eva uh, for a more good portion of the day, and then I'm with Steve for the other portion of the day. That's exactly right. You've got to spend time with each other. And that, of course, helps build trust. Jeremy's just looking up on LinkedIn who he is so he can prospect him. <laughs> I know what you're doing. I can see your eyes, Jeremy. Cool it, okay? Uh, let's do final closing thoughts for everyone, then we'll, we'll wind down. Does anyone have anything else to add? I think I, that I collaboration think, piece, working towards the same goal, that's really what should matter. We're trying to achieve this, whatever it is. Go out, you know, make the company public, you know, get sold, hit this revenue threshold, generate this many meetings. Like, you have to be working towards the same goal, or else, and it has to be coming from the top down, or else that never that collaboration piece and that alignment piece is never going to work. It has to be an org wide thing. And I think that's that's what I've learned and appreciated most the last two years and being you know in the ABM space, but at one of the vendors is like it, it's all about getting getting to trust the people you work with. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy Ross makes a good point. He says, sometimes the C-level shift is the best way to solidify this goal. CRO should oversee marketing and sales. That's actually a really popular trend happening now as CMOs totally. are going away and people are just having them move into CRO roles instead. Totally. Uh, well, thank you everyone for listening. We had a great episode today. Um, PFL, the band base, everybody in this crew, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Congrats on the acquisition, uh, Brandon and Nick. Even Craig, congrats on all your success too. PFL is obviously killing it. A lot of people talk about them all the time, and um, you guys are the you're a company I look up to. I don't I don't want to make you all bashful and stuff, but I like what you guys are doing. Um, Jeremy, thank you for coming on. I guess Rishi, you're cool too. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. We'll uh, be contacting. There'll be a yeah. recording sent to everyone, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Take it easy.